people sometimes call me the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> there is a certain there is a certain darkness to your writing. I mean, mm-hmm. I want yeah. I I want I wonder how someone who uh, has a very concrete faith interprets your writing. Someone who might not believe in that finitude. Oh, well, they wouldn't they wouldn't read my writing. Right. The last time I saw him, he asked me if I knew about time travel, and she wrote a book about it, so they can't be like a coincidence, right? Donnie, what did Roberta Sparrow say to you? She said that every living creature on Earth does more. How did that make you feel? It reminded me of my dog, Callie. She died when I was eight, and she crawled underneath the, the porch. To die? To be alone. Do you feel alone right now? I mean, I'd like to believe I'm not, but I just... I've just never seen any proof, so I... I just don't debate it anymore, you know? It's like, I could spend my whole life debating it over and over again, weighing the pros and cons, and in the end, I still wouldn't have any proof, so I just... I just don't debate it anymore. (laughs) It's absurd. The search for God is absurd? It is if everyone dies alone. Does that scare you? I don't want to be alone. This is Between Us. I'm John Totten. One of my secret goals for this show is that we might eventually develop an archive of audio documenting some of the great living thinkers of the psychoanalytic tradition. For our season finale, we are joined by a guest who belongs in that category, Dr. Robert Stolaro. If you see therapy as an intersubjective process, you've probably read something by Dr. Stolaro. Or maybe it was something he wrote with his longtime collaborator, Dr. George Atwood. If you aren't a therapist, you might not know what the word means, intersubjective. A really brief way of describing intersubjectivity is that it is the idea that the mind is not isolated, and that meaning is discovered in the relationship and interactions between two or more subjectivities. So how does that apply to therapy? Well, in my opinion, it makes it more meaningful for everyone. As opposed to the very stiff Freudian psychoanalyst who strokes his beard and quietly listens like some kind of objective observer, an intersubjectivist sees therapy, and relationship for that matter, as something that happens between two authentic and unique minds. To use an analogy from one of my favorite movies, because this is an episode where we talk a lot about movies, Goodwill Hunting. Think of the stiff and rigid therapist Will goes to see, the one played by George Plimpton, how he talks to Will like he has all the answers. Now compare that with the real talk that happens between Will and Robin Williams' character, Sean. It's a much different process. One perspective sees two isolated minds, one the observer and the other the observed. The other perspective sees those two minds as they are in a dance, discovering truth and layers of meaning together. Dr. Stolaro is a pioneer for this perspective. If you've read Dr. Stolaro's writings over the last 25 years, you know that he is one of the rare thinkers in our field who is not afraid to analyze himself in his writing as his own case study. In 1991, his wife Dee Dee died suddenly, sending Dr. Stolaro into a tailspin. His work shifted over the next few decades to focus on the human experience of trauma. Dr. Stolaro, who holds both PhDs in clinical psychology and philosophy, has a unique voice that has immensely influenced the way psychoanalytic theory is taught today, both as a clinical practice and as a way of understanding humanity through an existential lens, all shaped by his own personal reflection. His resume is extensive. He is extremely well published, and he was kind enough to talk to me from his home in California. Here he is. Thanks so much for being willing to be on the show. Sure, I'm glad to. 
you know, in looking over some of your work and rereading a lot of it, it seems like there are several um, distinct phases of what you have focused on and uh, more contemporarily, it seems like trauma and grief have been pretty important. Right. Right. Obviously, there's a point in your life where trauma and grief become of import- personal importance to you. Do you see a, uh, a synthesis between your earlier work focusing on subjectivity and narcissism uh, into your later work of trauma and grief? I do. Um, I might Before going into trauma and grief, I might summarize the perspective that had been evolving, actually, mm-hmm. in my work and also my collaborative work with George Atwood since the middle 1970s. I'll just say that briefly. We call it we call our perspective phenomenological contextualism. The phenomenological part is that we our focus is on worlds of emotional experience and the uh, structures that organize them, or you could say the meanings that organize them. And the contextual part has to do with our claim that these structures or meanings always take form in a relational context or what might be called an intersubjective context. So that's the, that's the overall framework, phenomenological contextualism, and it absolutely is uh, consistent with the work on trauma. In what way do you see it as being related? Well, I'll, I'll explain the evolution of, the, of, the, of my ideas on trauma, and I think that will come out. The first stab at emotional trauma occurred in an article that I wrote with my late wife, Dee Dee. Mm-hmm. It was just a kind of passing reference to trauma. This was published in 1985, by the way. And uh, the idea was that painful emotion that isn't able to find any attunement, any empathic attunement from another becomes traumatic. That seems to be a theme in your work as well for me, that there, there is as much importance on the responsiveness following an event as on the event itself. Exactly. So that's the contextual part of phenomenological contextualism. That's exactly the contextual part. When uh, Dee Dee died in February 1991, a few months after that, George Atwood and I planned a new book uh, to which I decided to contribute a chapter on trauma because I have, I was going through one. Hmm. The basic idea in that chapter was an elaboration of what Didi and I had written six years earlier or so. It was an elaboration on the idea that trauma actually has two parts. One is a source of painful feelings. That can be a loss, a rejection, a failure, whatever it may be, on the one hand. And then the second part is the absence of a context of emotional understanding, what I later came to call a relational home that could hold the painful emotions that had been evoked so they wouldn't have to be born alone. When that um, relational home is absent, then the painful emotions tend to become traumatic, unbearable, unendurable. So that was the main idea in that chapter, uh, which elaborated what I would call the context embeddedness of emotional trauma, the absence, the profound absence of a relational home or a context of emotional understanding in which painful feelings can be held and rendered more tolerable. Your experience of finding Dee Dee mm-hmm. uh, when she passed away seems to be a central moment that you come back to in your writings since then. Yeah, I, I was just going to get to that part because that relates, that relates to the second theme in my work on trauma, which I began to focus on uh, a little less than two years later, is the existential meaning of emotional trauma. A particular event triggered that focus for me. I uh, was attending a conference in which I was a panelist, and the book that George Atwood and I had begun putting together nearly two years before, initial copies were delivered hot off the press to the the conference. And I picked up a copy and whirled around to show it to Dee Dee, who would be so happy and proud to see it. But she was not there because she had died 20 months earlier. I had uh, 
awakened to find her bed lying across our bed. So the act of whirling around to show her the book and finding her gone just took me right back to the horrible, dreadful experience of waking up one morning and finding her dead. Hmm. Later, much later on, I, call, I called such a thing a port key to trauma, which I can explain later. Mm-hmm. Now, what got me going was the state of mind that I experienced after this happened. I went into a state of mind in which I felt that the conference and my professional world in general had become totally meaningless to me. I felt uh, that there was no way that my friends and colleagues at the conference could understand what I was going through since I was massively traumatized and they weren't, presumably. Mm -hmm. And so I began to feel a really painful sense of estrangement and isolation. I found this sort of grabbed my interest I'm I'm always studying my state of mind, even when it's devastating. And I began to uh, see these same themes come up with my patients who had also experienced emotional trauma. The themes of the world has lost its significance and the sense of estrangement estrangement and isolation. Mm -hmm. And I started reflecting on that. Why is that so? It took me about six years to figure it out. And what I fig- and I figured it out as a result of hearing a lecture by my friend George Atwood on delusions, psychotic delusions. He wanted to find a way to define a psychotic delusion without invoking the concept of objective reality and distortion. Mm-hmm. And he defined a delusion as an idea whose validity is not open for discussion which I thought was a brilliant definition of the delusion. Not open for discussion, meaning? The validity is not open for discussion. Hmm. It's just absolutely true, and that's it. For the person experiencing it. Right. Right, okay. If you've ever tried to challenge a delusion, you'll, you'll know what that means. It just makes sure. it worse if you try to challenge it. Sure. Because the validity for the patient is not open for discussion. So it's a kind of absolutism. And then I got this idea, what is it that's shattered in trauma? And I formulated it as the absolutisms of everyday life, that is the kind of illusions that we all live in, in everyday life, that uh, help us to feel safe. Uh, our, our being is continuous. So uh, some examples that I gave when I finally wrote this up in an article that uh, I wrote in 1998, uh, when you uh, say, uh, say to a friend, I'll see you later. It's hmm. kind of absolutism because you don't stop and say, well, I'll see you later if, you know, if, if I don't get hit by a safe as I'm walking to my apartment. Right? Hmm. You, you don't bring up those things. Uh, I'll see you later. That's just not open for discussion. Or more poignantly, when, you, um, when you're saying goodnight to a child and you say, I'll see you in the morning, it's an absolutism. It's not open. To, it's not open for challenge, or for uh, qualification. I'll see you in the morning as long as one of us doesn't drop dead before the sun rises. You would be considered not a very good caretaker if you left it up to, up to debate. You bet. You bet. So, it's these absolutisms of everyday life, as I called them, that trauma shatters, exposing what they have covered over, the, the, the dangerousness of our existence, the extreme vulnerability of our existence, the contingency of our existence, hmm. and so forth. So it kind of shatters all of the illusory assumptions through which people maintain a sense of safety and self-continuity. Are those absolutisms important for our survival, for our sense of homeostasis? Yes, they are, uh, especially for a young child, by the way. Sure. One reason why childhood trauma is so disastrous is because it uh, shatters these absolutism, absolutisms long before the child is developmentally capable of tolerating that. Hmm. So if a three-year-old asks his mommy, are you going to die, mommy? It would be a, a terrible uh, 
malatumin for the mommy to explain, yes, everybody dies, blah, blah, blah. You don't want to explain that to a three-year-old. Hmm. You want to let the three-year-old have the illusion that he and his mommy are here forever. Sure. So what trauma does is destroy that, and it's particularly de it's devastating any time, but it's particularly devastating to a young child who uh, doesn't hasn't developed sufficiently to be able to integrate it. Is that illusion related to our sense of narcissism and grandiosity? Well, uh, you could say it's it's a kind of benign form of grandiosity. Uh, mm -hmm. I think pathological forms of grandiosity can develop when those more benign delusions are sh or illusions are shattered. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, we could see that particularly on world events and so on. What precipitates wars? 9-11 would be a perfect example of that. Of the absolutism? Of their shattering collectively. Right. The sense of a, 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 shi a shining city on a hill. Exactly. And uh, you know, the, the Bush people were successful in mobilizing most Americans into a kind of grandiose quest to restore the, that illusion. Mm -hmm. The war on terror. It's America as uh, chosen by God to rid the world of evil, all of that stuff. You know, it's impossible not to think of our current cultural situation when we talk about absolutism and mm -hmm. uh, the and George's definition of delusion as something that's not up for debate. It seems very related to what is cur currently being called a post-factual society. Uh, I'm not familiar with that phrase, but it sounds right. What, 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 is, what does that refer to, post-factual? Well, this is something that I just hear in the news now. You can have a talking head who is saying that, cr that crime has been on the rise for the last 10 years when the data shows that it very much hasn't been on the rise. And you can have someone refuting him to his face, and the kind of impasse is, well, you have your facts, I have mine. Uh-huh, right. Right. The <laughs> effort to restore shattered absolutism or shattered grandiosity uh, don't care about the facts. On February 23, 1991, Dr. Stolaro awoke to find his wife, Dee Dee, lying dead across their bed, four weeks after her metastatic lung cancer had been diagnosed. In his book, Trauma and Human Existence, he says that the loss of Dee Dee shattered his world and permanently altered his sense of being. It was nearly impossible for Dr. Solero to find anyone who would dwell with him in the emotional devastation, save for his friend George Atwood. The two refer to each other as brothers in darkness. George's own story of traumatization and the loss of his mother at a young age allowed him to speak Bob's language. He told Bob, You are a destroyed human being. You are on a train to nowhere. On this interaction, Dr. Stolero later wrote, I think his dwelling in and integrating his own experience of traumatic loss enabled him to be an understanding home for mine. He knew that offering me encouraging platitudes would be a form of emotional distancing that would just create a wall between us. That train that Dr. Atwood spoke of, it might have been in circles. Dr. Stolero writes, about all the times he has been transported back to that February morning. Thirteen years later, he was jogging with his wife, Julia, when he was transported to jogging with his late wife, Dee Dee, as she was struggling with a cough right before her diagnosis. He calls these moments port keys. I was also going to ask about the port key, um, yeah. this experience of turning around at the conference and looking for Dee Dee. Mm hmm Right. Took you out of your t time and place. Exactly. So the, the term port key, by the way, was given to me by my current wife, Julia Schwartz, uh, from one of the uh, Harry Potter books. Port key referred to objects. You know, Harry, by the way, Harry Potter was a severely traumatized little boy. He, his parents were killed when, when he was very young, and uh, he was always uh, afraid of the uh, his parents' murderer coming to get him. And he was given over to another family who mistreated him very cruelly and so on. So he was a very traumatized little boy who emerged, talk about re restoring of uh, 
absolutism. He, he emerged from uh, the ashes of trauma with these wonderful powers of a wizard. So one of the things that comes up that my wife told me about were these objects or places that uh, would transport Harry, other wizards, to another location without any passage of time. So it was that illumination, how the port key eliminates duration, temporal duration, that seemed to me to fit these experiences of re-traumatization, including the one I experienced. That the port key just transports one back to an experience of trauma. It's not what people call flashbacks. It's an actual re-experience. It's a sense that one is actually back there again. And I've had many of those. Have you? Since that first one, <clears throat> that first one at the conference. Hmm. Now, what is important about that, one of the things that's important about that is that it totally disrupts one's experience of time. In the wake of trauma, time ceases to be a linear unfolding toward an open future. Instead, time becomes circular as one is returned again and again to the experience of trauma. Hmm. Now, what is it that makes that happen? Well, we're all finite. We're all vulnerable to being hurt, being rejected, uh, to illness, to loss. And everybody that we love is also finite. So hmm. loss can come up at any time. So any of these things that are basically manifestations of our existential vulnerability can throw us into a port key, and we're circling back to an earlier experience of trauma. Mm. And, and how does that relate to this sense of embeddedness? Are we embedded in the trauma at that point? Are we? Does it remove us from our context? Well, it does. In a way, it does uh, sever our connection to our current context and brings us back to the earlier traumatic context. Hmm. And that happens over and over and over again. You probably know the concept of dissociation, right? Sure. That is uh, often invoked as the, as the most common defense against the experience of trauma or re-traumatization. So the way I think of dissociation is that it's a defensive keeping apart of these two contexts, these two worlds one's current everyday world or everyday context and the earlier traumatically shattered world or shattered context. Uh, dis dissociation keeps them apart, trying to keep the traumatic shattered world from entering into one's current experience. I think of it as a kind of tunnel vision. Mm. And the earlier experience, the world of trauma isn't allowed into the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Unless one encounters a port key that push it, pushes it back into the tunnel with a vengeance. Hmm. Hmm. A healthier, more integrated situation is where one can actually move more freely back and forth between the two worlds or the two contexts. They're not defensively kept apart. Could, is that a goal of therapy in that, in that way? The way I work it is, yeah. Hmm. And so one of the hopes that we have in working with a patient like this or someone who has been traumatized is to create a sense of relational home in the room. Exactly. And you're probably going to ask me, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> because the, uh, the therapeutic comportment that I recommend that helps to do that is something that I call emotional dwelling. And it's related to em empathic understanding in which one tries to understand the patient's emotional experience from the patient's point of view. But it's more than that, it's more active, it's more participatory, that one kind of leans into the, the, the experience of trauma and the traumatic affect hmm. uh, in, in the language that one uses to communicate about it. Hmm. And some I call it uh, saying the unsayable and the unendurable. For many therapists, by the way, that is very counterintuitive because 
therapists typically want to soothe, calm, comfort, reassure, all of that stuff. That's, that's the worst thing you can do when you're trying to deal with emotional trauma because the, the, pa the way the patient experiences that is that the therapist doesn't want to get anywhere near the patient's traumatized state. In fact, the therapist probably doesn't. That's why they're doing the calming and soothing and reassuring. And what the patient's needing and maybe even longing for is for someone to be able to dwell with the patient in that very experience of traumatization. When your wife passed and Dr. Atwood said to you, you're on a train headed nowhere. Right. This was leaning into the trauma and, and saying the unsayable. Exactly. George was very good at that. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a speck of reassurance in the way George responded to me. Not a speck. I think that's counterintuitive for humans, not just therapists. Yeah, I think you're right. You're right. Well, because if you do dwell with another's experience of trauma, you can't do that without experiencing your own existential vulnerability. I hear this all the time from my patients. They come in after a trauma or a loss, and they say, I, you know, I can't, I can't burden my friends with this. I can't burden my family with this. I need someone to talk to about this because they don't feel, and, I, and justifiably so, they don't feel like they can really dwell with those in their everyday life. Right, with, very often with, with justification, as you say. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I don't particularly want to get into this, but as a supervisor and also as a second analyst for patients, mm -hmm. I've, I've come against some grisly examples of therapists and analysts rejecting the patient's experiences of traumatization. And it just, the outcome of that is horrible. I can imagine. Mm. I'm curious about the role of your own self-disclosure in those relationships. Um, obviously, your writing is out there. It's, it's easy to read about what you've experienced. Right. Right. Well, it's complicated. I mean, normally, my uh, attitude toward self-disclosure in general is it all depends. That mm -hmm. is, it depends on what the meaning of the dis disclosure would be to the patient and what the meaning of the disclosure would be to the therapist and whether those interacting meanings for both patient and therapist would facilitate or interfere with the therapeutic process. So that's sort of the general attitude I have toward self-disclosure. Obviously, I can't take that attitude towards something that's out there in the world that people are already aware of, right? Right. So, so, so I, I can't practice that kind of careful contextualism when it comes to that particular self-disclosure uh, because it's already there. Now, I think one of the things that might appeal to prospective patients who are familiar with my work is not so much, not only that I've gone through a trauma myself, but also that I've, I don't evade it. I face it. I reflect on it. I, I, I want to understand it, and so on. So I think that may be the thing that most appeals to prospective patients, that, they, that I'm someone who is not going to run away from their experience of traumatization because I didn't run away from my own. And it's meaningful for them to see you struggle and embrace that process. Yeah, e even on the printed page. Can I ask you about what brought you to this work in the first place? Uh, originally, when I uh, when I graduated from college, I was uh, a hard science major, and I formed this uh, ambition to to do hard science research on psychopathology. Believe it or not, hmm. and so I went to medical school. Uh, it was a terrible fit. I was not a happy camper. I lasted about five weeks, <laughs> and. I decided that where I belonged was a PhD program in clinical psych where I would get the proper training for doing hard science research. So, so I went to graduate school in clinical psych. This was at uh, Harvard, by the way. Mm -hmm. Getting involved in empirical research, I became totally disillusioned with it. I felt that by the time people got through with conducting a, a standard research project, you know, fig isolating variables, measuring them, doing statistical analyses, and so on, 
it, it took the research so far from what was humanly meaningful that I, I didn't, I didn't find it worth anything. It's, I st still don't. I rarely read about an empirical research study that I think doesn't do it, does anything useful. Usually, it just, usually if it does anything, it just confirms what we already know from our clinical work. <laughs> So I got this ambition, or I got this idea, I should say, uh, when I was a second-year grad student to uh, go talk to a former undergraduate philosophy professor of mine at Brandeis, who is now at Brandeis, about doing a concurrent doctorate in philosophy. And I had this idea of using philosophy to clean up the mess of psychoanalytic theory. And this was in 19, this was like 1967 or something like that, a long hmm. time ago. And he liked my idea, and he supported it. But the faculty at Brandeis didn't want somebody doing another concurrent doctorate, so they invited me back to do a postdoc after I finished my doctorate in clinical psych. Well, in the meantime, I did an internship at a mental hospital that was very psychoanalytic, psychoanalytically oriented and got some terrific psychoanalytic supervision at the time. And I found that I loved doing psychoanalytic work, and so... I decided not to do philosophy and instead to go to New York City and pursue psychoanalytic training. So that, that's how I got into doing psychoanalytic work. Doing a doctorate in philosophy had to wait 37 years after my first doctorate in psychology. Who were the theorists or the analysts who you considered formative at the time? Well, Fro of course Freud. I loved reading Freud, actually. Uh, I mm -hmm. devoured Freud's, all of Freud's clinical and, the and theoretical works. In addition, I was influenced by Karen Horney to some degree, mm -hmm. who, whose work was also studied at that institute. A, a lot of the ego psychologists were influential in my thinking. Mm -hmm. Fenichel, Edith Jacobson. And then I encountered the work of Heinz Kohut on narcissism and narcissistic disorder. That became very influential. We have a lot of people who listen to this show just because it's interesting and not necessarily because they are therapists. So I want to stop here and explain who Heinz Kohut was and why he is important. He was a psychoanalyst in the Freudian tradition, but he actually rejected and reconstructed a lot of Freud's ideas. For Kohut, analysis wasn't about conflict between the different parts of the psyche, but about helping the patient to develop a cohesive self. Freud thought that the narcissist was untreatable, but in this sense, we can actually see narcissism as a tool that allows us to regard ourselves highly and develop a sense of self-esteem. This was revolutionary for the psychoanalytic community and that it changed the way they thought about empathy, which was suddenly of the highest priority in the analytic relationship, no matter how difficult the patient might be. Kohut thought that the narcissist had this illusion of his own grandiosity and that to shatter that illusion would be traumatic and cause the disintegration of the self. This focus on the development of the self came to be called self-psychology and opened the doors for theorists like Dr. Solero to talk about the mind in new ways. I asked Dr. Solero about his relationship with Kohut. The two became friends in the late 70s when Dr. Kohut was already an old man. They developed a long-distance friendship, and their work fed off each other. Kohut's work on narcissism and the integration of the self is evident throughout Dr. Stolero's work on trauma, in that the shattering of the narcissistic illusion of grandeur, or an absolutism as Dr. Stolero might call it, can cause the self to disintegrate. We talked about how this happens on a national or collective level. It all seems really pertinent to me now, and I and I don't keep I don't mean to keep bringing it back to our political situation currently. It, it seems like there's a, a a crisis in understanding of narcissism right now. I think it's something that maybe not a majority, but a large proportion of Americans don't want to look at. Grandiosity is so much a part of American identity. That's one of the reasons why. That's one of the things that was shattered by 9-11, mm -hmm. you know, Americans could proudly say, we've never been attacked on our own soil. We won't count uh, Pearl Harbor cause, because it wasn't a, part, it wasn't a state. Mm -hmm. So Americans could proudly and grandiosely feel 
that they're immune. Mm -hmm. That they're immune. Did you say invulnerable? Invincible. Invincible, exactly. That's the grandiosity that was shattered by 9-11. I I don't think that uh, Americans have recovered from it, frankly. Hmm. So we could say that some of the less, um, less massive attacks, we could say that in addition to the horrors that they are in themselves, that they are also port keys back to 9-11. That's true. I was just going to ask, you've, you've done a bit of writing uh, recent years on cultural trauma. Mm-hmm, exactly. I call it I collective that. trauma. Collective trauma, right. And I was going to ask how that relates to your current definitions. And it, and it seems like our our collective in, uh, embeddedness is attacked, our collective sense of time. Well, yes. I would say that a collective trauma is one in which collective absolutisms are shattered, hmm. that, such as, as long as I remain on American soil, I'll never be attacked. Right. Nothing like that will ever happen here. Exactly. Exactly. I think the uh, absolutism that has been attacked for me in this recent election is that America will be around forever, or at least as we know it. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's scary because when when someone is dominated by pathological grandiosity, like Trump is, it's a good clinical example. Uh, When somebody is dominated by pathological grandiosity, like Trump is, what often happens is that when that grandiosity is challenged or shattered, uh, often what that evokes is a form of defensive aggression, defensive rage, which can be very, very dangerous. Hmm. A lot of times, you know, when you hear about murders that are committed by people in psychotic states, uh, very often those are situations where there's been a terrible injury to the to the person's narcissism, to the person's grandiosity, which he tries to restore by going into a, you know a, a McDonald's with an Uzi and killing people. Hmm. Yeah. So can I ask how your recovery from trauma has been? Well, I said in one of, in several contexts that the phrase trauma recovery is an oxymoron. <laughs> Because uh, there's another big part of my uh, the development of my ideas about trauma that I haven't mentioned yet, which I'll just mention quickly. W- when I was reading Heidegger's book, Being in Time, about a couple of years after writing my article on the trauma as the shattering of the absolutisms of everyday life, so about two years after that, I was reading Being in Time, and I came upon Heidegger's description of existential anxiety, and it sounded just like the state that I experienced at that conference. Mm. The world loses its meaningfulness. There's a sense of not belonging to the everyday world, being alienated, isolated, estranged, and so on. It sounded almost exactly like what I had described as my traumatized state. And the way Heidegger explained existential anxiety is that it entailed a kind of owning up to what he called being toward death or what might be called human finitude, Mm. uh, human limitedness, which is mortality is one dimension of that. Not only one's own finitude, but the finitude of everyone one loves. So it seemed to me that what trauma does is that in shattering the absolutisms of everyday life, it plunges the traumatized person into a state that's very similar to what Heidegger described as existential anxiety because it exposes what had been covered over by the, by the absolutism. Trauma exposes what had been previously covered over, namely our finitude, our, vulnerab- our, our existential vulnerability and the vulnerability of everybody we care about. You, you, you can't recover from, the, from human finitude. Once, once you've sampled it, in a trauma, that's forever. You can't, uh, once, once innocence is lost, you can't recover it. So instead of recovery, uh, what, I, what I conceptualize is something like integration. That's what I meant by being able to pass relatively freely between one's everyday world, one's current everyday world on the one hand, and the shattered world of trauma on the other hand. That's what I think of as the aim of therapy to be able to to be able to integrate those two those two worlds yeah they're both me they're both um, 
aspect of who I am. The example that comes to mind is to be able to plan a vacation and still enjoy the anticipation while still knowing that it might not happen. Yeah, or, or that the plane could crash. Right. <laughs> so an, another consequence of um, being able to integrate existential vulnerability is that it frees one. This, is, this was, you, you were alluding to this in your example um, mm-hmm. of a vacation. It frees one to be able to live more according to what really matters to one as an individual because you're not so occupied with evading existential vulnerability and trauma. You go on a vacation if you've been dreaming of rather than worrying about whether the plane is going to crash, Hmm. even though you're worrying that the plane is going to crash. The worry doesn't stop you. It's just there. You've integrated it. Exactly, because the worry is always there. You know, if you go back to 9-11, there was nothing in the lives of those 3,000 people who were murdered that could have led them to anticipate that on that particular day that they were doomed, that, which is another quality of our existential vulnerability. Trauma can happen any time. It cannot be forecasted. Hmm. Did you see this? There was a movie that really dramatized this. I can't remember the name of the movie. Uh, Donnie Darko. Did you see that movie? Yeah, I did. With the plane part that fell? Yeah. It's sort of like analogous to 9-11. This, the, uh, Donnie Darko was just at home in his bedroom, sleeping, and a jet engine fell on his house and killed him. Hmm. Well, that's another thing that trauma exposes, the unpredictability of our existence. Hmm. Trauma can happen at any moment, just like death can happen at any moment. It's like uh, accepting the fragility as, as part of who we are, but not the whole story of who we are. The other half part of who we are is all the things that, that matter to us and that we care about. And so this integration is a benefit to our ability to, to live authentically. Exactly. Exactly. Hmm. Dr. Solaro, thanks so much for being able to talk with me today. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. You're, you asked some great questions. Thanks so much. Have a good day. Thank you. You too. This has been Between Us, our season finale. Thank you so much for listening to our first batch of episodes. We won't be gone very long, but we do need a short break. Mason and I love producing the show, but it's also hard work that we do between seeing patients and all the regular stuff of life. Mason is always feeding his baby. I'm always feeding my dog. It's a lot of work. We do want to ask you a favor. We want to get the word out. We've developed a pretty sizable and dedicated following, but we want more. Maybe that's our own narcissistic illusion. So tell your friends who might be interested. Post episodes on social media. Please share. We're probably only going to be gone for a few months. The plan is to do a couple seasons per year. But we'd love to come back in a few months to more followers. In the meantime, subscribe to the show so you know when we're back. Find us online and take care.